Hello and good morning. I'm Patty James of the Commonwealth Club's Health and Medicine Forum. It's my pleasure to extend a special welcome to any new club members here for this digital program. The Commonwealth Club continues, continues to be an all digital program and we will be for the coming months. I encourage our viewers to become members of the Commonwealth Club and to learn more about membership, go to club, the Commonwealth Club .org. To support the club right now, with a tax deductible gift, please click on the blue donate button on your screen. An upcoming program that I am pleased to be hosting is on May 11th with Dr. Robert Lustig. We'll be talking about his new book, Metabolical, The Lures and Lies of Processed Foods, Nutrition and Modern Medicine. Mark Bittman has been a leading voice in global food culture and policy for more than three decades. Born in New York City in 1950, Mark began writing professionally in 1978. After five years as a general assignment reporter, he turned all of his attention to food. His first cookbook, Fish, The Complete Guide to Buying and Cooking, was published in 1994 and remains in print. Since then, he has written or co-written 30 others, including the How to Cook Everything series. Mark was a distinguished fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, and a fellow at the Universe Union of Concerned Scientists. He remains a fellow at Yale and is now on the faculty of Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health. He has received six James Beard Awards, four IACP awards and numerous other honors. He is also editor in chief of the Mark Bittman Project, a newsletter and website focusing on all aspects of food from politics to delicious. His most recent books and it, uh, is the history of food and humanity in which we'll be talking about today, animal, vegetable, junk. Welcome Mark. Thanks, Patty. Sounds like you're talking about somebody else, but yeah. <laughs> no, you actually did all that. I guess. <laughs> so the, the first chapters of your book, and if, if you enjoy history like I do, it was it was intense. Um, you delve into the, the history of agriculture and food. It's so interesting. M much of it extremely unpleasant. Stalin. Mao. <laughs> the interesting situation between Germany and Denmark in the early 1900s. That was fascinating. Uh, fascinating reading all around. But moving on to what has happened in the United States, we had the atrocity of slavery and the go west young man era. So I'd like to begin questions in that era. And I'd like to start with the United States Department of Agriculture, which you mentioned a lot in your book. So please tell us, Mark, who founded the USDA? That was fascinating. I did not know that. What was it? What was its original mandate? And what happened with that mandate over the years? Well, USDA was founded by Lincoln, um, who thought of it as the People's Department. He called it the People's Department. Yep. But Lincoln was uh, soon shot, as we know. Um, and the execution of what happened at USDA uh, fell to Andrew Johnson, probably the worst or second worst president we've ever had, and, and subsequent, subsequent presidents and, and department chairs. USDA has always had a dual mandate. And this is, it's discussed a lot in the book because of this. Its mandate is to support American agriculture and to help Americans eat well. Those became dueling mandates. In other words, it was the position USDA took, which was to support American agriculture from a pretty strictly commercial and business perspective, is at odds with what USDA and others later found to be our food needs, our nutritional needs. So what we have today, and this is developed Gradually, over those 150 or so years, 160 years, I guess, what we have today is an extremely powerful uh, department that promotes American agriculture at the money-making level. So it, the USDA is really most interested in how farm, established farmers can make money. They do support some pilot programs. They do some things for small farmers, but those are our 
for the most part, crumbs that fall off the table. Their primary work is to help industrial agriculture grow and even to help spread it around the world. That is at odds with teaching Americans how to eat well and helping Americans eat well. So we do have this kind of, this is, this is a very fundamental problem. The, the arm of government that is charged with helping Americans eat well is also charged with growing food that serves to sicken us. That, that's about as succinctly as I could put it. Well, yes, it was, um, it was, it was an interesting uh, hundred years uh, or so uh, following this and, and how far it, it has gone from the original mandate. So we're gonna talk about monoculture next, but before we do, um, there was one example you gave about food that I thought was fascinating. Um, I have to stop using that word fascinating. I think that's the fourth time I've said it, but it, it's an appropriate word. So tell us what does Heinz ketchup, sodium benzoate, and sugar all have in common? <laughs> and, or is that the, the very first big example of marketing? It's the first example of a food manufacturer, uh, probably not the first example, but it's the first important example of a food manufacturer using government regulation to produce a product that he could then market as sort of government approved. And what Henry Hines did was there used to be thousands of brands of ketchup, or at least hundreds, and they were local, essentially. And they were, I'm not saying they were good, some were good and some were not good, but they were used it was the way you used scraps of tomatoes. Uh, almost all of them used sodium benzoate as a preservative. And Henry Hines figured that if he could make ketchup without sodium benzoate, he could claim that everybody was producing ketchup with additives and he wasn't. And his, one of his main substitutes for sodium benzoate was sugar. So this is how we got to the kind of gloppy, sweet ketchup that we all know and most of us love, um, despite ourselves. This happened in conjunction with uh, a guy named Harvey Wiley. There's a great book on this subject called The Poison Squad, which I won't go into, but a guy named Harvey Wiley, who was uh, largely responsible for pushing what became the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act. Teddy Roosevelt was president. Um, and the Pure Food and Drug Act basically said you had to disclose on the label what was in your uh, food. So everybody except Henry Hines at that point had to disclose that they were using sodium benzoate in their ketchup. And um, Henry Hines began a big advertising campaign that said, if sodium benzoate is so great, why not emblazon it across your label that you've got it? Heinz ketchup doesn't, and it became, as we know, the dominant brand in ketchup as a result. But, but the, the key thing, I guess, is that he manipulated government regulation in order to use that regulation in marketing. So this is sort of the, the grandparent of uh, heart healthy, low fat, low cholesterol, no trans fats, et cetera, et cetera. Every time that... Uh, the government, and, and most of this is FDA, not USDA, but every time that the government mandates a label change, manufacturers have been able to figure out how to use that to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have lots of examples in the book of this, but this was the first one I believe you used, and I thought it was uh, uh, very interesting. So, um, a major theme, theme in your book, as I mentioned a little bit ago, is monoculture. You mentioned at the end of the book, actually, Full Belly Farm, uh, and you call it a slice of heaven in the Cape Valley in Northern California. Now, my niece Susan is married to Ken Muller, so they are also farmers and just live down the road. Their farm is pasture 42, and they live down the road from Full Belly. So they're, they, unlike Full Belly, who, you know, as you know, they're crops, but Ken and Susan have, um, you know, all pastured chickens, cows, beef, lamb, you know, um, and then, but they also have citrus and almonds and um, citrus, almonds, wheat, and um, something else in there. So this, that, there's both these farms are like farms used to be, but somewhere over, um, 
the years, they became these big, massive farms that only grew one thing. And a theme in your book is how these kinds of very diverse farms who grow and raise uh, grow food, uh, raise animals. They consumed it for themselves, their family, and then and then sold. But is it realistic with all the people that we have to feed in this country uh, that we could get back to these small, di- relatively speaking, diverse farms um, instead of these big, huge farms? And why? I'd love to know all the details and how obviously you have can't talk about all of that without talking about soil and climate. Uh, big well, question. You can't, yeah, everything everything is interwoven here. And, and any answer I give is is uh, we have to acknowledge immediately is is superficial and lacks the kind of detail you're going to find in the book, even the book. Even animal vegetable junk, in my opinion, is I, I don't want to be so self-deprecating as to call it superficial, but it's, it, it could be six times as long and still and still make sense. There's a lot of stuff you have to leave out in these kinds of conversations. OK, so if the question is, can we do diverse agriculture uh, and feed ourselves? The answer is we must, because the kind of agriculture that we're doing now is destroying public health. It's destroying the environment. Uh, it's contributing to climate change. It's unfair. It's unsustainable and so on. So we need an alternative. That doesn't mean that we go from the form of agriculture that we have today back to our, our vision of small family farms six weeks from now or six months from now or six years from now. We need to move in another direction. We need to make land available to people who want to farm it. We need uh, to make it clear that farming um, should take place under conditions that produce real food, like your, your relative's farm does, like Full Belly does, like many farms in the United States still do, that produce real food, that st- steward the soil, that minimize the use of chemicals, and so on. We have to move in that direction, and in order to move in that direction and still be able to grow enough food for all of us, we need more farmers and we need more land in farming. Now, people will say there is no more land for farming in the United States. All the arable land is owned. And that's pretty much true. But much of the arable land is used in the I know you want me to use this word in in monoculture, in growing one crop at a time. And if we have the entire state of Iowa, which is some of our most productive land, much of California, much of the Midwest, much of Texas and other great agricultural regions of this country growing corn and soybeans, primarily wheat and rice, secondarily, and very few um, fruits and vegetables that don't go into processed foods, then that land, we need to rethink how that land is used. So can we farm this land in a way that will feed all of us? The answer really to that is, can we turn 3,000 acre farms into 10 each 300 acre farms, which are run by families who would be supported in uh, learning how to do agroecology or regenerative farming or sustainable farming, whatever you want to call it. There are people who would like to do that. The land is already held by the descendants of the homestead of people who were given it during the Homestead Act, which was another act that took place just about the time of Lincoln's death, uh, which basically gave away land in the United States to white men. So it's those white men's descendants who now, for the most part, own our big farms and make it difficult for young people, women, people of color, uh, descendants of enslaved people and so on to get into farming, even if they would like to. So it's a it's a huge process and asking the it's a fair question to say, can we go from here to there? And no one knows the answer of how what what's at the end of the road. What we do know and what you and I can talk about. And and if we don't, someone will ask this question. What we do know are what are the first what the first few steps are toward getting on the road toward improving agriculture, to making agriculture um, actually work for us. Uh, We don't know what happens 
5, 10, 20 years from now, but we never do anyway. We know what's imperative and what's imminent and what needs to happen right now. And, and that moves us towards a better form of agriculture. As I said, very superficial. No, but, you know, I don't like 15 minute answers and I oh, know, I know you're I not know. interested in them either. So, well, and that this is why it was so difficult to ask, you know, to decide what to ask you, because your book is is I can't imagine how long it took you to write. It means it's there's so many questions we could we could talk for a week. But touching on I think you already answered one of the questions that we have is how's it um how do you reconcile uh, the argument that global industrialization industrialization of the food supply has fed millions who would otherwise have starved? And so since that question has already, you've already talked about that a little bit, but if you would, um, and I think in people's mind, they, they, they talk about this and they can't help thinking about Dr. Norm, Norman Borlaug and the green revolution and how, you know, um, you know, plant and will we'll feed millions. But there, there was a, another side to the Green Revolution that you go into in the book and whether it's sustainable and, and maybe some problems that came out of that. So since we're here, why don't you briefly touch on the Green Revolution? You know, we sometimes have, I'm guilty of this too, we sometimes have a lack of imagination. We, there's a, what's it called? It's, it's something bias. We look at the present and we assume that this is the way it was meant to be, but it's not necessarily the way it was meant to be. And, and there are a number of turning points in human history um, where agriculture could have moved in a different direction. Just as you can argue for the invention of the automobile and the, and the government's decision to allow automobiles to dominate over public transportation, and in a way, it's a similar decision. It's, it's saying, well, we want auto companies to thrive and we want this kind of weird individuality that Americans have been convinced they're entitled to have. And so we're going to make sure that everybody can have a car. And then you could say, as you just did about food, well, how would we all get from one place to another if it's enabled millions of us to get to work every day? Well, public transportation would have enabled millions of us to get to work every day, too. And similarly, in food, a form of agriculture that did take into account what people's what real food would do for people, what real agriculture would do for the land, what an avoidance of poisons would do for the environment, that kind of agriculture can feed people also. And in fact, that kind of agriculture already feeds about 70 percent of the people in the world. Our kind of agriculture, which feeds fewer people and uses more resources, has, yes, spread throughout the world. And you could argue feeds people that uh, helps feed people that might not be eating otherwise. But there are still close to a billion people hungry or starving in this world. And now we have close to two billion people who exhibit symptoms of metabolic diseases, uh, chronic diseases brought about by diet and so on. I'm going to talk about that for just for a minute. And it's uh, I'll also plug Rob Lustig, who um, is brilliant. And, and I will come to that. I will come to that. Um, that that event. Rob was kind enough to speak to my class of public health students last week. And um, he's he's really great. Yes. The, the point is. The point is that we've we've developed a kind of agriculture that's very machinery intensive, chemical intensive, destructive of the soil and produces food that isn't nutritious. And in fact, is often closer to poison, the dictionary definition than the dictionary definition of food. That is not beneficial. That is not us feeding the world. What we've done is starved and stolen land from small farmers, poor farmers, and force their governments to arrange for imports so that they could either be bringing in American chemicals and machinery and uh, intellectual property in the form of seeds um, and changing their own style of agriculture or importing American food. So part of the whole, and again, this is very, very complicated and, and books have and will be continue to be written about this, but 
part of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which was a kind of heir to the Green Revolution and more in the current memory um, because it was in the 90s. Part of NAFTA was a, essentially saying everybody in the world should be growing what they grow best and selling that. And as it happens, no one grows corn better than the United States, or that is no one grows more corn than the United States. And so Mexicans who rely on corn for, as a staple and who grew most of it themselves in a form of agriculture that is sustainable and was in fact uh, largely supported or to some extent supported by government policy, Mexicans were forced to choose between buying locally grown, well-grown corn for their tortillas at three times the price of corn that was imported from the United States or not. The upshot of that was that many Mexican farmers were forced to sell or give up their land and flee north looking for work or to wait for the United States or other countries to establish factories in Mexico where labor costs are lower so that people could find work, former farmers could find work. This has been a tremendous transformation in the in in our closest neighbor and in a way our closest natural ally, especially in the Southwest where the borders are so permeable and California was Mexico after all. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. But, but similarly, the Green Revolution was an exporting of American product and American goods and American know-how. It was not the savior of the developing world in terms of agriculture by any means. No, I, after I read uh, your section on the North American Free Trade Agreement, then the internet became a black hole as I looked into a little bit more. And I was, um, well, it, it was sad to, to yeah, hear, a, it was just sad. The so Green I'm Revolution is a good marketing market. term. Um, yeah. And it was a tremendous PR campaign, but it was not the the, wonderful, beneficial uh, at all aspect of American agriculture that we no, grew no, up that, thinking it was. Yeah, that, that was very interesting. Um, sad, like I said. So you touched a little bit on, um, you know, and, and again, it's Rob's, Dr. Lustig's, you know, we ultra processed foods and, and the danger of that. And so there's ultra processed foods and uh, food choices that might help with the climate, concerns over farm workers, and, and all, these, all these things in our heads when we go to the grocery store, the farmer's markets, in order to decide what the heck, you know, to do the best we can as eaters with all these things. And so it's, it's a little difficult. So let's, if you would, just take us through um, one example. And for some reason, hamburger popped in, into my head. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, really, truly. So, you know, a hamburger, should I, is it better? I mean, for the animals and for, you know, is it better to buy and eat an impossible burger or in, if not, why not? And, or, or beef and what kind? So walk us through a hamburger choice. I'm going to, I'm going to start at the end. And the okay. end is, um, we need government policy that encourages the production and the consumption of good food. What we have now is government policy, and this was your first question, really. What we have is government policy that encourages the production of food that's not good for us. So that includes all of this corn and soybeans, largely, which is either uh, fed to animals, and we kill and eat something like 60 billion, that's with a B, animals every year as a country, um, or, or used to produce junk food, which really does make us sick. Um, animal products are not necessarily bad for us. Uh, there are some, Rob Lustig will talk about this, there is some evidence that some, some animal products are, are not great for us or are worse than neutral, but for the most part, um, eating meat isn't a terrible thing for people, but it is a terrible thing for the environment at the, at the, the way that we're uh, raising animals, or, or I should say producing animals, because we really don't raise them anymore. Obviously a terrible thing for the animals. 
It requires a great deal of antibiotic use, which we'll probably get into later. Uh, the growing of the corn and soybeans, of course, is done with all chemicals and genetically modified seeds and so on. So how do you buy a good hamburger? I mean, there are alternatives besides the impossible burger. You're, it's, not a, it's not a duality here. It's not an either or. Yeah. Um, I, I would I'd point out the, that legumes are the primary source of protein in the world. Uh, and an ideal or a near ideal source of protein, uh, and that there's no need for us to eat animal products. There's also no need to turn that those ideal proteins, legumes, or or even good proteins in the form of whole grains. There's no need to turn those into artificially produced weird fake meat products. We can, I mean, I can give you a recipe for a black bean burger that's really good. Um, and you can make it home with three or four real ingredients. You don't need to go out and buy a relatively expensive, hyper-processed, ultra-processed um, fake meat burger. If you want to eat meat, I mean, everybody in this audience knows the answer to this. If you want to eat meat, you want to buy it from a farmer or a farm where you know how the animals were raised. That's not something everyone can afford. It's not something everyone has the wherewithal to do. That goes back to the original. That's why I said I was going to start at the end. We need government policy that encourages the production of good food. So a choice like that of buying well-produced meat or a well-produced hamburger is within everybody's reach. Now, that may mean that hamburgers are more expensive, and it may mean that we eat less hamburgers. But those are reasonable things to do. Um, we're going to be using less chemicals. We're going to be using, going to be using fewer pesticides. We're going to be treating the land better. None of these things is easy and they may not be as convenient as agriculture is for us now, but if we want to live on a clean planet, a planet with clean air, good water, uh, with topsoil that is, is, uh, uh, maintained and with, with less impact on the climate, then we have to figure out ways to do agriculture better. Like the one man, um, I think he was in Missouri where he's growing, um, is it a kind of wheat with really deep, deep roots? Um, so I, I don't remember all the details. It wasn't actually one of the questions, but I just remember thinking, well, isn't that interesting? So, um, you know, because he's been working on this, I guess, for quite some time to get those roots deep is better for the soil. You, you don't turn it under. I, I don't right. know. There's, lots There's a lot of you're talking about. You're conflating a few things, but the, you're <laughs> mostly talking about West Jackson and the Land Institute in Kansas who have developed uh, or revived a form of wheat called Kernza, which does have very deep roots and is perennial. It doesn't have to be planted every year. Yeah. So if that can become commercially successful, that has huge impact. And they've been working on that for years. Yeah. yeah. So now um, on to food quality. Um, you know, again, a concern of everybody. Um, and food labels have nothing to do with quality. So with that in mind, you know, somewhere over the years and Rob, Dr. Lustig, we, you know, we've talked about this quite a bit, you know, uh, it, it bugs the heck out of him that, you know, it's, you have added fiber. The reason you have added fiber is because they stripped the fiber and put it back in. So this whole added nutrients, um, when did that start and just to, again, I think the take home for everybody is that your food labels, it's not doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the food. But talk about added nutrients. Well, you can learn about your food by reading labels. Yes. So it has something to do with the quality of the food. But let's remember the ketchup conversation. Yeah. What what Henry Hines did was say, oh, well, they're going to make us put on our label what's in our food. I'll manipulate the food so that the label looks better. When, um, when it was determined that, sorry about these birds, when it was determined that. <laughs> it's lovely to hear. When it was determined that um, that high fat food might not be heart healthy, and much of this was 
mistaken research, but okay. Um, and food was labeled low fat. Manufacturers quickly took advantage of the fact that people were looking for low fat food and produced low fat food, which was high in calories and high in sugar. When it was determined that high fiber was beneficial to your diet, which it is, rather than promoting legitimate high fiber foods like whole grains, vegetables, fruits, legumes, manufacturers took their ultra processed foods, their processed foods, and added uh, fiber to it, um, therefore being able to put on the label that their food was high fiber. A lot of this began when foods were stripped of their, especially um, wheat was stripped of its nutrients to produce white flour and later white bread. And it was, when it was found that Americans were uh, developing uh, micronutrient deficiencies, uh, vitamin deficiencies, as a result of too much or eating a great deal of white flour, rather than mandate that flour uh, be processed to retain its fiber and other nutrients, government simply mandated that artificial nutrients, chemical nutrients were added to white flour and this was in order to reduce um, vitamin deficiency, diseases of vitamin deficiency. And, and this was the beginning of adding fake vitamins to foods like flour and breakfast cereal and so on, foods that, foods that had become so processed that they, they barely had any nutrients at all. I, I'm looking at a question here. Have, have you talked with some of the big agribusiness leaders? We must convince them, I think, uh, you know, for their own self-interest as human beings, we must do something different to protect us from. Um, and then I can't read some of this. Uh, it's OK. I can respond to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, continue feeding everyone. There has to be population control. Well, that's probably a whole different topic right there. But but good point. Um, but anyway, yeah. And I think you've touched on the big agribusiness, but um, I think uh, maybe a little bit more dialed out. But be and then I want to get back to sugar, but I'll go ahead and answer her question first. It's like, who is, what is, who's a conduit um, between, um, you know, the climate people um, and the big agribusiness? I, I, I know in the nutrition world was, you know, there's a lot of information that's siloed. People aren't talking to each other or so how um, agribusiness, how, what do we do? How do we convince people? Or is it the same thing as the, if the people lead, the leaders will follow eventually. So what's the solution to that one? Well, again, I don't want to say what the solution is because the solution is way down the road. Yeah. I do think we need to be working. Uh, we people who are concerned about this need to be working on local municipal state and federal levels to make progress in the world of food. I do not think we're going to convince corporate leaders that it's important for them uh, to produce food that's less profitable because that's our mutual benefit, including the benefit in some ways, but it's not to their benefit if their major interests lie in, in personally making hundreds of millions of dollars a year, because this is how they're going to do that. So um, if we think about food as a human right, if we think about uh, providing food for our people as a public utility, in a way, the way we think about water and electricity. Um, excuse me. Huh? <sighs> okay. Please, <laughs> until I wasn't. Um, the way we think about water and electricity is that we try to make them uh, suitable and available to everybody in a, in a form that can be um, useful and as undestructive as possible. Sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't. We don't think about food the way. We think about food as a profit center for companies. So if we change our attitude, if we're able to change government's attitude and regulations around food, we will change the way food is grown, produced, uh, processed, and eaten. Um, we're not going to do that by uh, the CEO of, of Heinz Craft or of Pepsi to produce better food because that's actually not in their interests. 
Back to sugar. Uh, you touched on that. Well, you, you started, you talked about the low fat movement and it was interesting. Uh, John Yudkin's book, Pure, White and Deadly, that came out in uh, uh, 1972 uh, with the, um, you know, the, the big concern about sugar. Um, and and that mantle has been passed to many people. Well, here, Rob, last day again. Mm-hmm. And, We're not going to talk oh, about him. I anymore. know, I know. It's just like <laughs> he should be on this. I know he has another something today, but, um, but you know, there's Nicole Avina and Barrett Tarman and, and many, many people working on um, food addiction. And there's many people who still do not believe that it is a real thing. And I posted programs here with um, doctors and scientists, neuro, neuroscientists on the addictive nature of sugar. But if um, Yudkin's book um, wasn't met with a, a, you know, a whole lot of favor by big business and somehow magically ended up being the beginning of the no or low fat movement. So th- how did we go from warning people about sugar to putting it on the back burner and sort of morphing that into the low fat movement. What happened? Um, I mean, government has acknowledged over the years that sugar is not good for you and that sugar, you don't want sugar. It's not a dietary requirement. But um, the big money at that point was in uh, the anti-fat movement. That's where that's where scientists were buying into, and that's where lobbyists were buying into, and the sugar lobby manipulated that so that very little attention was paid to the possible dangers of sugar. As my friend and, and co-author David Katz sometimes, just because one thing is a bad actor, fat, for example, doesn't mean that another thing, sugar, for example, can't also be a bad actor. We can have more than one thing, having a negative impact on our diet. And sugar certainly has a negative impact on our diet. And even FDA and USDA recognize this. They now recommend that that fewer than um, than 10% of our uh, calories come from from sugar, but it it could be less than that. And it should be less than that again, or not again, since we haven't talked about this. Sugar has been... Um, added to the majority of ultra-processed foods and has found its way into food that we don't think of as sweet, salad dressing, tomato sauce, pizza, and so on. Um, There is is, uh, more sugar and salt hidden in our diets, hidden in ultra-processed foods, than we add to foods ourselves. And... um, that, of course, is is largely unregulated. Mm-hmm. Well, now to a, a topic that, you know, I um, near dear to my heart in that children's health. So, um, you know, of course, ch- a child's health begins with a, a with a healthy pregnancy, you know, and, and but children, you know, the whole addictive food, you know, the, what's in the food system right now, how that is not fair to people who don't have as much money. There's more, not as much, many healthy food choices for them. Um, So children, food, and maybe start with, um, you know, the, um, the school lunch program that you talk about quite a bit, but let's spend some time um, on children and their health and our food supply. My feeling, and and I think most people in the food who think along the same lines as I do would agree is that if we want to have a healthy adult population, we have to educate children about food. If we want to see healthy 40-year-olds, we need to develop healthy four-year-olds. Everyone, um, everyone who's listening or watching here knows how hard it is as an adult to change your diet. And that's because our preferences are formed even beginning in utero, but certainly we're there formed before we're old enough to do to tell the difference between truth and lies. And so we're subjected to marketing campaigns as children that teach us that Tony the Tiger is our best friend and that um, there's nothing more than going to McDonald's and that the most refreshing beverage we could possibly drink is Coca-Cola. Um, those things are lies. That food is not good for us. And yet we're encouraged before we're old enough really to think 
to be consuming it. Um, and it, this is not the fault of parents. So it's going to have an impact on this, of course. This is the fault of allowing marketers of ultra-processed food to have free access to the minds of children. Um, it's also not a question of, uh, to some extent, it's not a question of choice because the majority of calories in the United States today come in the form of ultra-processed food. That is, there are more calories in ultra-processed food than there are in real food. You mentioned John Yudkin, and when his book came out, Pure, White, and Deadly About Sugar, the 70s were a period of real activism around food and other things also, obviously. And food activists brought to the Federal Trade Commission, to the Senate Subcommittee on Nutrition, a host of issues around food, including limiting the amount of advertising that could be done to children. When food manufacturers in the 50s and 60s discovered television, they must have thought they died and went to heaven because for almost no money, I mean, literally four figures, $5,000, $7,000, whatever, they could buy time on Saturday morning television and in watching cartoons that Tony the Tiger was their best friend. Now, in the 70s, some of that was limited. The amount of advertising you could, the amount of junk food advertising you could push to children was limited in the 70s. Most of those regulations were rolled back thanks to Ronald Reagan. Um, and they've never been reinstituted, but it doesn't really matter because now most children watch television on the internet and there's no regulation at all on the internet. And I, I doubt there's a single parent in this country who knows everything their children is seeing on the screens that their children are holding in their hands or, or sitting and watching in front of them. Uh, but there's a great marketing that's at, geared toward children on children-oriented programming on the web. Yeah. Um, couple questions. Um, Richard, can Mr. Bittman discuss the challenges for the inner city population who do not have the financial ability or access to purchase products? As simple as fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, and then I'll get to the other two questions in a little bit. Well, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to answer that. Thank you for that. But let's talk about um, what could be done in the very near future. And that's one thing that needs to happen is improved access to fruit and vegetables for everybody, improve access to fresh, real food for everybody. So how does that happen? And again, I don't want to go from A to Z. I just want to go, what should we be doing this year, for example? So, um, the Bay Area, as you know, has the highest concentration of soda taxes of any place in the country. And kudos to Berkeley for getting that ball rolling. And UCSF, um, yeah. Uh, one thing that we can do is tax soda and use that money to subsidize the production and the distribution of fruits and vegetables. That really hasn't happened yet. There are, as I said, some, some progressive USDA programs uh, such as a program that's usually called something like Double Box, which allows for uh, money spent at farmers markets, food stamps money spent at farmers markets to have enhanced value. So you can buy twice as many fruits and vegetables for a dollar using food stamps as you can using a regular credit card. That's the kind of program we need to see more of. So let me just go through three or four things that I think ought to happen in the near future, and I think can happen in the near future. One of them is help for black farmers and other farmers of color. And believe it or not, that's actually happened. Not fully, not as well as it should, but we're beginning to see glimmers of hope there. Another, I mentioned the high use of antibiotics in producing animals. That is low hanging fruit. There are countries in the EU and elsewhere that have outlawed the prophylactic use of, of antibiotics in animal production. Our FDA could do that tomorrow, not that it's going to happen tomorrow. And it could have done it when President Obama was elected and, and inaugurated in 2009, and it failed to. It can do that in this administration. The thing is outlaw carcinogenic chemicals 
in in farming, uh, which would have a huge impact not only on farm workers, but on the land and on the rest of us. And that's not even saying make food organic, which we can talk about in five years or something like that. It's saying do this one thing that's actually pretty easy and can happen now. Uh, what else? Limiting the marketing of junk food to children, doing some regulation about how junk food is marketed. And uh, another thing would be, uh, another thing that would be a big change in the food system would be establishing the $15 an hour minimum wage, which would aid not only farm workers, but tipped workers, the majority of whom work in restaurants. So again, I know that the Bay Area is and California in general has done a lot of good legislation on this, but much of the rest of the country has not. So we're not anywhere near being done on that issue either. But what these four or five things I just talked about have in common is that they're achievable now. They don't address your very good question about what it would look like down the road. How do we have a sustainable food system? I don't know the precise answer to that. I know how to get started towards that towards making good food available to everybody. And these are the kinds of steps we should be taking right now. And then we can talk about what the next steps are after that. And sometimes it's little steps. And you just mentioned, well, this is actually a big step, but you mentioned SNAP benefits. That's supposed to be supplement, supplemental nutrition. Nutrition, meaning that, you know foods that actually support your health, and yet you can buy candy and soda with SNAP benefits, which is not nutrition. It's anti-nutrition. Oh my gosh. So, you know, somebody <laughs> you just take on that one thing. In fact, Tony, suggestions for anyone who wants to get involved with sustainable food. Well, that's not quite the same thing, but it's, but it's still, it's still, you know, what is something that I can get behind to help? And I'm hoping that somebody that the SNAP benefits are overhauled. So they, you know, don't include candy, and soda, which is doing great harm, um, you know, to children, to to people. So um, yeah, there's there's lots of there's and this kind of brings me into the the last part of, of your book and the last and we have a, a couple more questions. Something um, destruction of rainforest. You know, we all know that's a huge issue, and but. Um, <clears throat> Maybe we'll get to that a little bit more in depth and a little bit perhaps. But the, you give at the end of the book, you know, the whole a good portion of the book is here's what happened. Here's what happened as to why we got here, which is not in a good place. But then you also, uh, you know, give um, some hope as, as to what people are doing, like the man with the deep perennial wheat with the deep roots or or tell us some of these. And you mentioned black farmers. And I understand that there was something that uh, a, a long time coming. Uh, they won some sort of lawsuit with the USDA that was like, you know, for um, racism. And that was recent after many, many years. But anyway, again, your book is full of so many more things that we have time to talk about. But give us an idea of 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 what um, and I'm I don't know if we're going to be able to get to the destruction of the rainforest. We know that's you know palm oil and and beef and we know it's a problem. And I'm hoping just like the people with the SNAP benefits, I'm hoping there are people working on that. Maybe just just touch on that very quickly if you can answer her question. Um, we don't have time to talk a lot about the Amazon in depth, but. What can we avoid purchasing that would have something to do with the destruction of the Amazon rainforest? I mean, again, we need to have limits on how and regulations on how food is produced. Um, the Amazon rainforest is not under much of our control, um, our as Americans control. Uh, certainly some of those, some of the soy and corn that's grown there, some of the beef that's raised there, goes into McDonald's uh, burgers. And, and I don't think I need to say to this audience, you're better off not buying and eating fast food. That's clearly the case. Um, the fundamental change that needs to happen, and it's not going to happen soon, but it's something worth thinking about. And it can happen 
in our lifetimes or at least in the lifetimes of younger people involved here um, is a determination of how food is grown and how land is used. If land is allowed to be used uh, by big business to grow the most profitable food possible, then we're going to be subject to a diet of ultra processed food, which is bad for us and bad for the environment. If it's determined that land should be stewarded by people who want to raise real food to feed themselves, their families, their communities, their regions, then we will have a form of farming. It all really begins with farming. We can only eat the food that's produced. And until we determine wisely what food is produced, we're not going to be able to eat good food. So the federal government gave this land away 150 years ago and has barely regulated what can be done with this land. And the, the upshot is that what's grown, what's produced, what's processed, and what's marketed is all determined by big multinational corporations. We need a system by what's grown and produced, marketed and eaten is good food. And, and that can only happen um, through an active, intelligent government policy. Mm -hmm. um, one more question. Thomas, we, we did talk about soda tax um, a little bit ago. You might have missed that part. But we did talk about the benefits of, of the soda tax and how it's been helpful at UCSF, at, at Berkeley. So I, I think we already covered that one, didn't we, Mark? Yeah, I mean, more or less, more or less. I mean, there's always more to talk about. But so give us again back to this now that we segued off a little bit to the Amazon and 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 sustainable food. What can we do? But give us some ideas of speaking of what we can do. Give us some ideas of some of those wonderful things that are happening uh, across our country in 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 farming, in sustainable food. You know, there was there's a lot of interesting things going wonderful things going on in Detroit. Give us some examples from the um, from the end of your book as to the right. good things that are happening besides all this horrible stuff. That well, there are two ways in which we can make change. One is to do better policy. And I talked about that a few minutes ago. And the other is to model better ways of doing things. So urban agriculture, such as that happening in Detroit and elsewhere, teaches people urban agriculture is not a powerful mover in terms of how much food it can produce but it is a powerful mover in showing people how food is produced and what real food means. So the birthplace or the, the original hotbeds of, of urban agriculture in North America were Milwaukee, Detroit, Toronto had a very active movement, but now we see urban agriculture everywhere. And I'm not talking about high tech agriculture, vertical farming or anything like that. I'm talking about real gardens in real cities run by real people. These are things that can teach people, uh, teach us all about how food is grown and, and, and processed. Um, similarly, people working with farm workers groups, with labor groups, people working to eliminate pesticides uh, and other chemicals in agriculture, working to protect farm workers. So there are dozens and dozens of such organizations. I like to plug an alliance of them called Heal Health Environment Agriculture Labor Alliance. Heal Alliance, which is based in Oakland, as it happens, um, and which is a, an alliance of alliances, a group of groups of people who are working to improve the food system in a variety of different ways. We can, of course, locally support farmers markets and CSAs. We can support local fishing efforts. We can support local farms that are doing things right um, by actually volunteering there or by uh, buying food directly from them, um, and so on. I can't think of anything else at the moment, but the point is that the models, the models, like, as I said, I, I once did a back of the envelope calculation about how many farms like full belly, which you were yeah. talking about yeah. earlier, yeah. we would need to make a huge impact on the American agricultural system. And it's thousands but the idea that there is a model, that there are models that say, here's how agriculture can be, do, can be done well, those are very powerful ideas. To say, here's what it might look like if we were to do things well, that's a very powerful notion. So I think legislation, regulation on the one side, 
and modeling of good ways to do things on the other side. These are two things that we need in order to move forward on improving the food system. Yeah. Now, what, and I almost hesitate to bring this up, but, you know, I, I know people who are, are have, have their own personal food way of eating their dogma, really. Um, and I say all the time, I, I don't have one. Um, you know, if I want a tuna sandwich, I'll have that. But I, I eat a lot vegetarian, like I think you. I mean, I kind of lean towards a Mediterranean diet, but um, but I also, you know, my I had the first certified organic cooking school in the country, organic, you know, local. It's just how I grew up. We didn't have a name for it then. My mom was a home cook. We had a garden type thing, you know, so, and that was, I was very lucky with that, but then you've got, and, you know, you've got people who are, are vegan, you've got vegetarian, you've got, um, you've got the keto people. Um, and again, I recently I interviewed uh, Gary Tobbs who the keto works for him. And I brought up the environmental aspects and, you know, there's no good answers for a, a lot of this, but, you know, again, it's, it's very, um, and it's almost can sometimes, uh, delve into the, you know, kind of religious fervor, um, uh, category. So how, um, I don't even know if there's an answer for this, um, but there the, is actually. And the uh, answer okay. is everybody. If I say eat well, yeah. the image of eating well that comes into everybody's mind is pretty much the same. We know that we need to eat real food. We know that we need to eat food that's less processed. For many of us, we know that we need to eat fewer animal products. For all of us, we need to eat food that is closer to natural to use a sadly bastardized term, but closer to natural food that comes from the soil, food that is recognizable as food. Uh, we need to be eating real food. Everyone agrees on that, regardless of what they call their diet. And I think um, that's probably a good ending place, actually. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Now, we have a few more minutes left, so um, we don't have any more audience questions. I think I've hit all of them. So we, we've covered the, the history. And, you know, again, I, I did not know about all the peasant farmers dying under Stalin and Mao. I, I didn't know about um, the slaves that, you know, worked the, the ground and then weren't part of the homestead, you know. Um, so th there's a lot of... Um, disturbing uh, parts of your book, but that the end, and I think we as humans, we all need to, to know that, that there's a, there's a solution to this because, you know, children, grandchildren, we want our children to be able to lead a, a healthy life on an earth that, that can sustain itself. So I think these little tips are, are very important because otherwise, you know, it's like a, a little kid cleaning out their sock drawer, you know, it's or whatever. Um, it's it's too much for people. So they don't do anything because they're stymied. So I, I think, you know, you know, at the first of the year as a nutritionist, you know, it's like, OK, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And I'm going to work out. And it's too much. It's not sustainable. Um, so I think it's important to give people and our audience at the common wealth club it's important to give them some take homes you know that they can bring into their lives right now so um and you know and again i'm also very cognizant of not sounding elitist you know go to your farmer's market support your farmers well you know uh, you know if you've been to south chicago or harlem or the pine ridge indian reservation in south dakota where they sell box o bacon and uh, you, it, you can see inside it's just the the fat that's all it, that's all it's in there at, on the reservation there so you know but what are some what are some little things that people can do now or or um you know, to help the climate to help their own health their family's health just like three three things that people can do well i mean questions. i'll say one thing i think it is eat real food that is really the the first and last thing to say Okay, well then there you go, eat real food. So I think we've I've hit everything. Um, we have um, a couple more minutes. So what else would you um, like to, without a question, anything mm -hmm. else about your book and congratulations on the success of it because it's it's a it's a very important book. I hope hopefully everybody will read it. If not, just to find out what happened between Germany and Denmark in the in 1917. That that was interesting. 
Ashley, for the last couple minutes, well, we only have two minutes. Brazil, you didn't mention Brazil when I asked about um, some nice, good things happening in the world. And I know it's tweaked a little bit over time, but Brazil has had tremendous success on some of their in some of their programs. You, you go into depth on Brazil. I do. But let me just wrap up here a little yeah. bit. I think that I think that the goal in writing this book is to get people to take food seriously. Food is, uh, as I said before, it could be treated as a public utility and it's not. It's obviously key to life. Um, many of us take it for granted uh, and it's that's OK. It shows up for many of us. We need to think about what food means, what food is for and how growing food affects all of us. Um, until we start doing that, we're not going to build a good food system. Um, and it's imperative that we do from a climate perspective, from a public health perspective, from an environment in general perspective, from a labor perspective, and so on. We need people who will farm, who can farm affordably and farm well, who could steward the land for us and who can grow real food for themselves and for their communities. That's kind of the bottom line here. Bottom line. So I recommend that everyone uh, purchase and read Mark's book. We've just touched on on the basics. There's so much more to learn. Um, so, but for now, our many thanks to you, Mark, uh, for your comments here today, as well as uh, for those listening to this recording. This program and more like it uh, will be posted on the club's uh, website, uh, CommonwealthClub.org. And now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California commemorating the 118th year of enlightened discussion is, to, is adjourned. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.